you want to take your Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter 25. Next week is Mother's Day. We've been looking at the various times when Jesus interacted with women in a significant way. This one is a, is a parable about different, or actually ten, ten different women, young women, that is. Matthew 25, first 13 verses. This is what God's Word says. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So weddings today are a little different than they were back then. When you have a wedding, there's a lot of traditions, there's a lot of rituals, and, and uh, different cultures have different rituals and traditions in how they, how they do their weddings. So weddings today, usually, not always, but often they're, they're at churches. Back then, weddings were mostly at family houses. So a bride's house or, or a groom's house. And weddings today, the, the groom usually just stands there, usually right about, right about there, and, and the bride comes to him. Back then, if you were a groom, you went to the bride's house to retrieve the bride, and then you usually brought her back to your house, and there would be this big, big uh, group of people that would follow you and, and celebrate with you. Today, weddings, we have a, a processional where all the, the bridesmaids and groomsmen, they, they all process in usually along, and then the, the bride at the end. Back then, they had this parade. So there would be, as the groom goes to retrieve the bride, there would be this big parade that would follow them around, and they would, you know, make all this noise, and, and they would announce that here, here comes the couple, you know, and everybody would cheer for them. So they'd kind of deliberately go through the town and they would try to get as much cheering as they could get. But there's a couple things that are kind of always the case for, for weddings, whether it's back then or, or now. There's lots of feasting and festivities. It's a, it's a joyous occasion. It's, it's exciting that uh, there's a new couple being married together. Um, there's, there's a contract that's signed. Um, sometimes, sometimes even more recently now, um, couples are even signing their marriage, their marriage license even as a part of the ceremony now. Um, but back then they had a contract then too. It was probably simple, but they did have a contract. Weddings are major occasions. It's kind of an all-day event. It it takes up most of your day to, to even attend a wedding. The same was true back then, too. In fact, some of their feasting would sometimes even go many days afterwards. So it would be a huge celebration. And receptions, back then and now, are usually in the evening. So it's usually getting dark when, when the reception starts and when it ends. And another thing that's the same, it's important that everyone is ready to play their part in the ceremony. 
Because there's a way that the ceremony is supposed to go, and there's a lot of players involved in that. And so it's important that everybody who's involved needs to be ready to play their part, whether you're just processing in or whether you're playing or maybe doing a solo or, or whatever. Everybody's got to be ready to play their part. So there's an element of needing to be ready when there's a wedding. So that's what's going on here. There were 10 virgins, it says. This is basically young women. Virgins means young unmarried relatives or friends. So these would be kind of like their equivalent of our bridesmaids. And so they have a special function in all of the proceedings of how this is going to happen here. They're supposed to be leading the, the welcome to receive the, the couple. It says the bridegroom, but it would be the couple. The bride would be with the bridegroom there. Now, it talks about lamps here too. The lamps were really important back then. I mean, we, we use flashlights and stuff now. Back then, and even to this day, in the Middle East, all women carry lamps at night. In the Middle East, if you're a woman and you're going out at night, you carry a lamp. That's just kind of a standard thing that you do. This is for your safety, and it's also for your reputation. So this was kind of just something that you did. If you were going to be going out at night, you brought your lamp. And that was... Just something they expected, that was something that everybody did. Your safety and your reputation depended on it. And so they would have these lamps, and because this is in the evening, when the, the bride and bridegroom are arriving, to go out and greet the couple at night, you needed lamps. So five of them were prepared, and five were unprepared. It says five were foolish and five were wise. Basically, five were prepared and five were unprepared. Five thought ahead and five didn't. Five were ready and five were not ready. Now, back then, there were no clocks or watches I mean, there were a few places that maybe had sundials, but if it's at night, that doesn't really help you too much. So, without those things, you don't really know when the couple is going to arrive. It could be at any time in this large window, like any time from 6 to midnight. That's, that's a long time. So this, this bride and groom, they could arrive at any time during the night. The sun goes down usually around 6. So they're coming, the, bride gro- or the, the groom goes to get the bride at the bride's house, and, and there's usually a whole train of people behind. And so then he, he gets, gets the bride, and they, they're going to go back to the groom's house, and there's this big parade behind them there. And they're going around through all the city streets and trying to, get as much cheering as they can, and so who knows how long they're going to meander around through town before they finally end up at, uh, at the groom's house to enjoy all of the, the feasting and the celebrating. They don't know when. So you need extra oil to make sure that you have enough. So kind of like in the winter time, it's good advice if you're going to, especially if you're going to be traveling somewhere and the roads aren't that great. It's good advice to have enough gas in your car because if you were to be stranded or to get stuck and it's really cold out, it's good to be able to keep the car running so that you won't freeze. They needed to be prepared. If you're going to be traveling in the winter time around here, you need to be prepared. Keep your gas tank full. I've actually been a couple times where I've regretted not filling up my tank before a trip because I got stuck. It's been a few years now, but you get stuck, you get really cold pretty quick. When you don't know what's coming, 
You need to be prepared. You need to think ahead. And so these five who should have brought extra oil, they needed to be prepared and they weren't. Now, something is also true for us here too. As the heavenly bridegroom, Jesus could return at any time. The Bible compares Christ to, the, to a bridegroom in a number of places. Most notably in, in Revelation, when Jesus comes again, it talks about a wedding feast for the Lamb. So Jesus is like the bridegroom, the church is like the bride. Our bridegroom could come at any time. We don't know when. And because we don't know when, we have to be ready at any time. Whether that's today or tomorrow or a thousand years from now. Because we don't know the schedule, we need to be ready for anything. We have to be in it for the long haul in case it is going to be a long time. It says here, the bridegroom was a long time in coming. Well, when Jesus ascended into heaven, that was maybe like 33 AD. It's been almost 2,000 years now. The bridegroom has been a long time in coming. We need to continue to persevere and be prepared for the long haul because it could be another 2,000 years for all we know. Nobody knows. So Jesus can return at any time. We have to be ready. That's what this parable is about. It's about being ready for when Christ returns. So finally, in the, in the parable here, at midnight, the parade finally reaches or gets close to the groom's house where everybody's waiting to, to celebrate. So there's usually somebody out front in this parade and crying out, hey, here's the bridegroom and the bride. Come out to meet them. So when they finally hear this at the groom's house, everybody inside the house runs out and you know, it becomes like a welcoming party there. They probably line the streets to the house and everything. And so the cry comes out. And there's five girls who are ready and there's five who aren't. So the parade announces the arrival. Everyone rushes outside and there's these 10 girls who need to be part of this welcoming party. This was kind of part of their role here. And five were ready and five were not. So the girls go to look at their lamps and get them ready for going out at night, like they do. The girls fix their lamps because in these, these little lamps here you have, it's usually about this size and it's got this container of oil and this little little tube at the end where there's this wick and that wick is kind of loose so you need to make sure that that's adjusted right and uh, you need to make sure that there's oil enough oil in there so they go and fix their lamps they attend to their lamps it says they trim them they, they're they're basically fixing them getting them ready to go outside And when they go to replenish the oil, there's those five who realize, oh, we didn't take any extra oil. But then there's others, oh, they've got oil, and they're pouring it in. So the unprepared girls, and it, it literally says this, give to us from your oil. That, that oil that you have, we, we want some of that. Give, give to us from your oil. They don't say, oh, no, we're out of oil. They don't say, do you have extra oil? They start barking commands. Give us your oil. So there's, there's a little bit of an attitude going on here. You know, when you, when you drop the ball, it's kind of important to remember that it was, it was your mistake. And to recognize that and to be ready to take whatever consequences come your way. So, for example, this week I had a doctor's appointment on Thursday. And uh, I was writing my sermon and just kind of into it. And I was not paying attention to the time. And I looked at the clock and it was exactly the time I needed to be there. 
So I raced there. I went the speed limit, but I got there as fast as I could. And uh, by the time I got there, they said, you're going to need to reschedule. I was like, oh, man. But and the, and the, the woman behind the counter, she was like, sorry, you know, a little sheepishly, but I was like, my fault. I should have been paying closer attention to the time. I dropped the ball. It's not your fault. It's mine. So I had to reschedule. When, when you drop the ball, it, it's important to remember that you made the mistake, and so if there's going to be any consequences, those are going to come. You accept that. This, this woman behind the counter was kind of acting like I was going to get mad at her or something. But this is how it works. But when we're proud and entitled, we make demands. And we're all prone to this. When we, when we have a high opinion of ourselves, or when we're not thinking about other people, and we think that we're owed something, we make demands. We want special treatment. We want the rules to be bent for us. We think that maybe we're above the conventions or the rules. And we like to bring other people down because of our mistakes. So instead of recognizing that, hey, I made the mistake, I'm going to suffer some consequences, this is what happens, okay. I'm going to try to bring everybody else down because of my mistake. So this is kind of like, there's another parable called, about the rich man and Lazarus. Some of you are familiar with that parable. Where this rich man basically ignores this poor man. He feasts his whole life and he's starving. And both the rich man and the poor man die. And then when the rich man dies, he, he goes to hell. And once he's in hell, he, he can see into heaven and being in hell, he starts barking orders to people in heaven. It's not, whoa, boy, I, I really messed up. No, there's, there's some entitlement there. There's, I don't deserve to be here. Imagine if you're in line for a concert. Some of these concerts, you've got to get in line early to get a decent seat. So you're in line for maybe hours. And let's say you're waiting all day to get in line. You've got a good spot in line, and, you're, and finally the line starts to move. So you're going towards, towards the place, the people who are taking the tickets. And suddenly the friend that's standing with you says, I lost my ticket. Give me yours. Your answer would be, um, no, it's time to go in. I'm not going to hand you my only ticket when you lost yours. That's what's going on here. Give us your oil. No. Their answer is actually has a double negative in it. So it's more like absolutely not. In other words, your irresponsibility is going to make us all late for this. We're going to all miss these festivities. We're all going to not be where we're supposed to be. This is a wedding. So we thought ahead and we're ready. Don't make us all late. The answer is absolutely not. So just knowing, knowing that the attitude of demanding here, these, these other girls, they probably just stomp off like, you know, how, how dare they? So they're going to find some other oil. While they're stomping off, the bridegroom and the bride arrive, and they go into the groom's house, or the house, his parents' house, and they're going to enjoy all these festivities. There might have even been some, some dancing in the streets, along the way there. And so they all enter the house, the door is shut. You do that when it's nighttime, especially back then where there's no street lights and other things like that. It's a safety concern. So they all go in, the door shut, and all the festivities begin. So for these five girls who were unprepared, 
their unpreparedness makes them miss their role in the ceremony. So some of, some of you have, are, are, are married, some of you have had your own wedding ceremonies. Usually you kind of want things to go well. And usually there's people that you're depending on to, for things to go well. So imagine half your wedding party not being there when you're lining up about ready to walk in. They're just, they're just not there. So you got the scramble. It, it's, it's really kind of humiliating. Like, where are they? What happened to them? And so these girls, that because they were unprepared, they insult the couple and the host by doing this. This is, this is a big insult. You can't think ahead a little bit because of this important occasion. This isn't important enough for you to be prepared, apparently. So it, doing that, they, they insult the couple and, and, and the host. The host would be the, the groom's family because that's where the festivities are. And so they are going to be forever known as the girls who weren't there. I was reading some on this, and one commentator said, this, this is the story that girls of that age at that time, this is what their nightmares were made out of. Because not only do you bring shame on the couple, who is probably your relative or close friend, but you also bring shame on yourself and on your family. And you will be forever known as the girls who weren't there and weren't ready. So the girls come back. They finally get some oil. It's probably not too difficult to buy oil, and even to borrow some oil, because in a small town back then, everybody knows everybody. People don't move around like they do today. So everybody was, everybody who's there has been there their entire lives, and they all know each other. And so, if you needed some extra oil, somebody could easily give you some, even at, late at night like that. So they probably didn't have too much trouble getting oil, but upon returning, they make some more demands. They demand that the door be open. Open the door for us. It's phrased as a command there, actually. Open the door. We deserve to be let in. We expect to be let in. And even though we've insulted you, you owe us something. It's the entire wrong frame of mind here. And then there's that answer. I tell you the truth, I don't know you. That's a weird answer. It's a very surprising answer for a culture that is flexible with time and that prioritizes relationships. So we, we live in a culture that prioritizes time. So if you don't show up for an appointment, you have to reschedule. That's just the way it is. In warmer climates, relationships are prioritized. And so if people are a little late, that's okay. You just kind of go with the flow. If somebody stops you on your way to an appointment and they want to talk to you, you talk with them for a half hour. And you'll get there when you get there. It's, it's, a different, it's a different way of thinking. That's this culture. This is a warm climate culture. I did a, I did a, a wedding for uh, one of Deirdre's cousins, and she married somebody from Ecuador, where it's a warm climate. And so his family and a bunch of his friends were up. It was in Grand Haven, actually. And uh, we had to constantly reinforce this. Okay, you make sure you show up for pictures at this time. Make sure you show up for the ceremony at this time. And remember, this is American time. This is not Ecuador time. American time. So, in other words, it is going to start on time, whether you are there or not. In Ecuador, it doesn't work like that. In the Bible times, it didn't work like that. Things were flexible. The bridegroom could arrive at any time. And so it's a real surprise 
that not only are they not allowed in because they're late, but the expression is, I don't know you. That's really weird. Because of course the bridegroom knows his own friends and family. And being late is not uncommon. In Israel, there's a, there's a travel guide that actually says, Punctuality is very relaxed. Expect to be kept waiting at the beginning of a meeting. Sometimes you're lucky if the person shows up at all. But you don't disown the people for showing up late. So, this response, for them especially, is very surprising. It's very awkward. It's very shocking. And so, here's the shock. Here's, here's the part for us that we need to pay attention to. Like it or not, God's kingdom has a door and it will shut. Our salvation is a, is a prized commodity, okay? There is a limited amount of people who are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. God is not politically correct. He is not interested in our approval. He's not interested in playing our expectations or succumbing to our pressures to be you know, inclusive and all of that. That sacred cow of inclusiveness that's alive and well today is not going to be adhered to on the last day. Salvation is limited. There is a door and it will shut. Look at the screen. Let's say this together. Are all saved through Christ just as all were lost through Adam? No. Only those are saved who by true faith are grafted into Christ and accept all his blessings. So this is what we need to do. This is our, this is our responsibility. The lesson that is here is that we need to be prepared. When there's something that's a big deal in your life, you make time for it. You prepare for it. You plan ahead for it. If it's a wedding, there's tons of planning that goes into a wedding. Because that's a big deal. The things that you forget are things that usually aren't a big deal. And so if there's something that's a big deal, you're going to think ahead. You're going to plan ahead for it. So, Christ coming back, coming for, for us, that's a big deal. Plan ahead for it. You think your wedding was a big deal? This is a big deal. This is a real big deal. Eternity is in the balance here. Just assuming that you're in, that doesn't work. The, the girls that forgot, they weren't planning ahead, they just kind of assumed that they were in. It wasn't that big of a deal to them. That doesn't work. So, attend to your faith now. Right now. Today. Attend to your faith. Where are you with the Lord? Because not all who call themselves Christians actually love the Lord. Not everybody who's enthusiastic now for Christ will be enthusiastic ten years from now. Some people, they kind of run out of steam. Not everybody who's religious on Sunday is faithful on Monday. Where are you with the Lord? Is, is God some, something you keep on a shelf? Is He your fire insurance for getting out of hell? Or is He your Lord and Savior? Is He the one that you take with you throughout the day, every day? Do you look to Him for everything that you need? Is your trust in Him? Or is it in yourself and your own resources? Where are you in your faith? Because we don't know when the Lord is coming. Not only that, we don't know when He is going to come for us individually either. Any of us can die at any time. 
So where are you with your faith now, today? Be prepared to persevere for the long haul. We don't know the schedule. We don't even know the schedule of our own lives, for that matter. The ones who were unprepared, they had no extra oil. They just assumed that it was going to be a short time. They didn't need to prepare. Or they didn't care, one way or the other. The prepared had extra oil. They were ready for any time. Since we're talking about weddings here, when you, when you get married and you say, I do, till death do us part, you don't know how long that's going to be. Some people are married for 70 years. That's a long time. Some people, that's not even a year. When you say, I do, you don't know how long it's going to be. You have to prepare for 70 years, whether it's going to be 70 years or not. So are you, in your relationship with the Lord, are you ready for that long of a commitment? If you lived 70 more years, would you still be faithful to the Lord? Or are you only prepared to go with him a few more years? So a question for all of us here, just so that we can examine ourselves and consider what the Lord is trying to teach us. The question for us all, if you knew you would die tonight, if you knew that, would you have to scramble today? If today was the last day that you were going to be alive and if you knew that the Lord was going to come for you tonight, would you have to be scrambling today to get right with the Lord? Or would you be ready? And when you saw him, would you be excited? The Lord is coming for me. Let's not be unprepared because the Lord's coming is a big deal. And let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Our Lord God in heaven, Lord, you are a big deal to us. Lord, you are very important to us. We pray, Lord, that we would be prepared, that, Lord, you would be on our hearts, and that, Lord, we would attend to our faith today. Lord, we know that we are not saved by our our works, we're saved by our grace, but Lord, your grace shows itself in our hearts and we want to be ready for you. Lord, teach each one of us to to be ready so that when that day does come, we will be excited to see you and not be scrambling. You are our Lord and we are your servants, your children. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.